MacArthur and I call the member for Fremantle. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, last week on Twitter, a person called for my execution for treason because I had questioned the government's rapid escalation of our new involvement in Iraq from a purely humanitarian mission to one where we appear to be joining the US in an open-ended fight against IS. A call for my execution may be extreme, but it demonstrates how the beating of the drums of war and the hysteria this generates inevitably prevent the kind of calm, serious and rational discussion that is called for when decisions are being made to commit Australians overseas to kill and potentially to be killed. It is natural for us to respond instinctively to confronting images. The graphic and brutal murders of Westerners David Haynes, Stephen Sotloff and James Foley, people who only sought to do good in the world, have offended our sense of humanity and stoked our desire for justice in a way that countless other atrocities in Iraq and Syria, as well as in Gaza, Afghanistan, Pakistan and in many countries in Africa, seem not to have. But given the disastrous consequences of previous military interventions, as well as the continually evolving and incredibly complex situation in the Middle East, it has perhaps never been more important to curb that natural instinct for retaliation and the use of hard power and consider the root causes. In this, it may be helpful to reflect on what an elderly woman in Northern Ireland said to one of the former heads of our national counter-terrorism organisation before the peace talks. If you've got nothing to live for, you've got everything to die for. The challenges in Iraq, some caused, others exacerbated by the ill-judged coalition of the willing in 2003, arise from deep ethnic, communal, cultural and religious issues. As the Ottoman Turks discovered and has, has, been, and has, has become even clearer ever since, these are never going to be resolved by outsiders, especially not outsiders with guns and bombs, and not by approaching this as a crusade against a death cult. Fundamentally, this is an issue of human security. And does anyone believe you can ensure the security of humans by bombing humans? At the centre of any credible national security policy is human security, individual well-being and community harmony that allows people everywhere to go about their business without fear, without constraints on their freedoms as enshrined in law, and without the constant worry that someone wants to take their possessions and enslave their children. That, of course, is the essential meaning of the term security, without worry sine cura for the classicists. The authoritative and internationally respected commentator Rachel Sharby made the following observations just this week. It should be obvious by now that if such bombing campaigns have an effect, it is to make things much worse. What Western leaders portray as valiant efforts to rid the world of evil forces such as ISIL just don't play the same way in the region. In Iraq, for instance, Western military intervention is viewed as support for the authoritarian, sectarian and West-approved leadership whose persecution and airstrikes are so bad that many Sunnis are prepared to put up with ISIL for now as preferable. Western military intervention thus gives ISIL its recruitment, of, recruitment fuel of choice, a war with self-interested external enemy around which to galv galvanise support. Meanwhile, arming supposed moderates in Syria is equally delusional. Even self-declared moderates have on the ground allied with the currently dominant ISIL in the fight against dictator Bashar al-Assad and even these so-called moderates have carried out beheadings and other brutalities. A cursory glance around the region shows exactly what happens when the West arms groups that somehow fit the moderate descriptive, as one writer most succinctly puts it. The terrorists fighting us now, we just finished training them. As with the situation between Russia and Ukraine, Australia has no strategic stake or status in Iraq and Syria, except as a compassionate and engaged member of the international community. One has to ask why on earth the UN was not our first port of call, especially at a time when we occupy a valuable seat on the UN Security Council, where we can examine with other countries uh, more familiar with, uh, with the situation in the region than, than we are, the potential for political and diplomatic solutions. That means considering the use of smart rather than hard power. It has been a matter of great surprise and disappointment to me that the government has not engaged with the UN before committing special forces and equipment to the so-called coalition of the concerned. In my view, we should be endeavouring to ensure there is a broad-based international partnership engaging moderate Islamic states such as Indonesia and Malaysia, as well as neighbouring Middle Eastern states such as Jordan and Turkey, under the auspices of the UN to address the very real humanitarian and human security issues that are at the heart of the current problem. 
In my earlier speech on the Iraq conflict on 4 September, I called for a formal debate in the Australian Parliament. While this would be unlikely to change the result, it would represent uh, an open and proper process for the Australian Government in relation to our involvement in a conflict that will be costly, that will inevitably have serious and uncertain geopolitical consequences, and which at this point is very poorly defined in terms of time, scale, objectives, cost, rationale, international legal basis and underlying international agreement. Such a debate would have the effect of airing the many issues and questions that remain unanswered. For instance, how does the use of armed force in the manner that the US, Australia and the other participants in the current coalition intend to apply it actually serve the humanitarian and political objectives that should be at the centre of the international community's response to events in northern Iraq and Syria? Airstrikes in northern Iraq may deplete IS but are also likely to displace some IS members to other parts of Iraq and Syria. After the billions spent by the Coalition of the Willing on training and equipping the Iraqi army, it still seems as though its capacity to deal with such threats remains limited. Does this then mean a second attempt to train and equip the Iraqis? Why would this be any more successful than the first time? Does it mean a return to boots on the ground in Iraq, and if so, by which countries? What will happen in Syria, where Bashar al-Assad's forces have committed atrocities against civilians on a grander scale than IS, and where various countries have provided funds and weapons to either side to continue that conflict by proxy? If the proposal is to arm only moderate free Syrian army fighters, as opposed to, say, an al-Qaeda-linked group like al-Nusra, what would make such, such fighters stop fighting Assad and start fighting ISIL? Are we going to start arming Hezbollah or the Syrian army itself against ISIL? Is it possible to guarantee that weapons will not be used against civilians? How will the coalition deal with the participation of countries such as Saudi Arabia that have been involved in supporting Sunni jihadist groups like IS? Let's remember that Saudi Arabia is a country in which beheadings by the government regime are commonplace, including for the offence of sorcery. How will the coalition treat its partner Egypt, where hundreds of Muslim Brotherhood supporters have been sentenced to death? and where journalists, including Peter Greste, have been sentenced to long jail terms after sham trials. Uh, and how uh, will our government treat Australian citizens who have travelled abroad to fight with moderate groups against Assad and or IS? Will they be the recipients of our weapons and assistance in Iraq or Syria, only to, only to be prosecuted when they try to come home? There is enormous danger in moving to so quickly that these questions are not examined and when the possible consequences are not thought through, anticipated and planned for. I'm not suggesting that we should not be involved in protecting civilians from atrocities, nor that we should not endeavour to bring perpetrators of these crimes to, to justice, but that our actions should be based on humanitarian objectives and in accordance with the international rule of law. I'm concerned too about the increased security risk to Australians everywhere as a result of our involvement in further action in Iraq. I was working for the UN in the Middle East when Australia joined the so-called Coalition of the Willing in 2003. I was advised by security officers of the heightened risk I faced as a result of Australia's involvement in that debacle. In some places, such as Egypt, I was even advised not to disclose the fact that I was Australian. Australians like to think of ourselves as being universally loved, but this is not always the case particularly as a result of our involvement in Iraq in 2003, as well as the public positions taken from time to time by Australian political leaders in support of Israel's actions against the Palestinians, even where these are plainly contrary to international law. These issues matter to a great many people in the world, and we are foolish if we fail to think through the consequences of our words and our actions. One of these consequences is the fertile ground such issues provide for the recruitment of new members to the extremist cause. Finally, I note that with the present focus on national security, it is extraordinary that the Prime Minister is not attending the Global Summit on Climate Change. In this year's quadrennial defence review, the US Defence Department describes the threat of climate change as a very serious national security vulnerability. Australia's current national security strategy lists climate change, along with the threat of the resurgence of violent political groups, as a broad global challenge with national security implications. National security is not all about jet fighters and special action forces, or even the numbers and powers of the Australian police. If the Prime Minister really wants Australians to insouciantly go about their business, he needs to re-examine his climate change policy, or lack thereof, which many Australians, as demonstrated in yesterday's climate action rallies, regard as regressive, ignorant, destructive and politically self-indulgent. Deputy Speaker, no one will argue against steps to genuinely improve the security of Australians. But the core issue here is whether the steps this government is taking at home and abroad are being properly considered and calibrated to meet the reality rather than the hype. 
to achieve properly defined outcomes rather than draw us into yet another counterproductive military engagement. And that judgment cannot be made when there is no meaningful debate in the national parliament. The member's time has expired. I call the member for Macquarie. Thank you.